Hey everyone, we have a new feature in the Lean Design Simulator related to sequencing. So I wanted to share with you in this video how to actually use it. Pretty exciting uh, advance to the Lean Design Simulator. So here is the Lean Design Simulator master data file. The current version, uh, at least as of this recording, is 5.0. And what you're going to want to do is download it if you don't have it already, and that'll give you all the new uh, capabilities that you'll need. So here it is, and let's just quickly click through what, what is in this file, and then I'll go into more detail as to how to use the sequencer. So we have the flow description. We have two flows here, main and subs. We have resources, uh, five stations, a test station packs, and then the subassembly station, and three labor categories. I'm not going to go into too much detail here. There are other videos that explain uh, this. Now we have our flow, very sequential, just one, one single line, uh, one station connecting to, to the next. So that's all very straightforward. We have six different products, plus uh, remember that you have to define the subassembly as a product, even though it doesn't reach the end of the line. It's not an end item, but you, we still have to define it as a product, a subassembly product in this case. And this is a change from maybe what you're familiar with previously, we're now documenting the subassemblies on this sheet. So what this tells us is that product two requires sub one, and product three requires sub one, and product four also requires sub one. Also remember that sub one has to be defined on this list. So this is a product that you're listing here. The other products, uh, one and six and uh, five, do not require this subassembly. All right, then we have process times, nothing new here. We just, for every product and every station, we define a time. And this is the sequence data worksheet. The uh, Lean Design Simulator does not look at this sheet directly, uh, but we're using it to create a sequence using the auto sequencer, the new functionality. So let me explain to you what's required here. In column A, we have the product. That's the same product code that you will have had to have created uh, previously in the products worksheet. So nothing new there. You don't need to list all of the products. These are the products that you want to create a sequence for. So there may be products that you're not, not sequencing, and they, they don't have to be included here on this list, but these need to be valid product codes. That's the important point. B is the demand. So these are the quantities that you're going to sequence. These quantities could be your current demand. It could be the demand you used to design your mixed model line design. But the point is that these quantities are what you're going to create a plan for. So they can be whatever you want. It can be next month's forecast demand. It could be today's actual demand. It could be demand over a year period. Whatever it is you want to create a sequence for is what you uh, include in this list. Now the order, column C, is important because when you create this sequence, it's going to sequence in this order. So it's going to try to plan or sequence product one first, and then it'll go to two, and then it's gonna to go to six, and then go back to three. So this gives you a lot of flexibility in terms of the uh, priority that you give to these different products. There are some that you always wanna to try to plan for first. For example, you may want to always try to schedule the hard ones, the high work content products first. So you put those first in the order, and then go on to the next hardest, et cetera. So this gives you control over that order of, of planning. D is min quantity. So the default here is one, so I can, I can, I can mix these one at a time, but they, that may not be the case. You may have a situation, for example, where product one always needs to be run in groups of five. So it's going to sequence five in a row here. Uh, so again, this gives you control over the, not, not the batch quantity per se, but the number of, of these units that you need to run back to back. All right, so I will uh, just put this back here for the time being to one. Column E is repeat. So this is a calculated column. This is basically for your information. It just tells you how many are going to be repeated in the sequence. So if we have a demand of 14, and I can do them one at a time, then the sequencer is going to spread those 14 out over the sequence, and you'll have 14 instances, or rows, if you will, in your sequence plan for product one. 
And as long as the quantity is one, then pretty much this repeat is going to match the quantities that you want to run. It's going to spread those out. However, if we had a, let's say a quantity of five, you can see that those quantities of five are going to be repeated three times on the list. In other words, three groups of five are going to be run in the sequence as opposed to being able to run them one at a time. So again, the sequencer is going to use that information, uh, but it is a calculated field. Now, spacing is important to understand. That's column F. Spacing means how much space in the sequence do I want to allow between products? So uh, spacing of zero means it doesn't matter. I can put, I can't put uh, products in the same time slot or the same tack time, but I can, I can put them right next to each other. But if we have a rule, for example, where I have some high work content products and I never want to run them or be able to run them back to back unless I can't avoid it, then I would put a spacing value of one or some higher number in there. What that would say is when I'm sequencing a list of products, I'm going to try to make sure that product one is one space away from other products in the list. And of course, the order in which it's looking at that is the sequence you're defining here. So spacing means try to, can't always do it, but try to put one space in between this product and the ones adjacent to it, or two spaces between them. So the sequencer is going to use that uh, information to uh, create its logic in terms of how it, how it creates the sequence. And zero means you can just put one product next to the other without any problem. The interval, finally, last column, inter, uh, column G, interval just means uh, how many units between uh, do you expect to see uh, in your list. For example, uh, product one, uh, I have 14 of those, and the total demand here is uh, 57. So I would expect on a list of 57 products to see this product one every four units or so if I'm trying to spread them out evenly over that day. And product two, I'm going to see this every 29 slots or 29 tack times, every 19 tack times, etc. So again, this is calculated. This is more or less for your information. But when you look and validate your sequence, this is what you can expect to see as best, you know, as much as possible. So understand that when we're sequencing, uh, especially when you get closer to the end of, the, of creating a sequence, the ideal may not always be possible. So the logic of the sequencer is to do the best job uh, it can to fit within this goal, but it may or may not be actually possible when you get down to the, the reality of, of the time slots that are available. Okay, so here comes the exciting part. We have our sequence sheet. You should already be familiar with this if you're using the Lean Design Simulator. And this is what the simulator is going to run. So it's going to start with the first row, which is row number two. So it's going to, it's going to run a product one, and then a product two, and then a product six, and then a three, et cetera, all the way down. Now, when you make changes to the sequence data file, you want to run a different scenario or try something different. Uh, instead of having to recreate the sequence list manually, uh, what you can do is just click on this auto sequence button here. And what the auto sequence macro then will do is look at the sequence data file and apply the logic that you defined, the order in which you wanted to create the sequence, the quantities that you want, and build that sequence for you automatically. So this could save a lot, a lot of time in creating different scenarios that you want to test. So basically, you just click on the auto sequence button, and it asks you, uh, "Do you are you sure you want to do this? Because I'm going to I'm going to erase anything that you have here on this sheet, and I'm going to build a new sequence." Now, if you don't want to erase what's on this sheet, what you can do is copy this sheet to a new sheet, give it a new name, uh, and then you can run the macro on the new sheet and not affect your original sheet. So if you get to this point and you go, whoops, no, I don't want to delete this. I want to keep this in the archive, so to speak. Then just click on no, and uh, you'll be back to where you started.
But if you're willing to blow away this sheet and start with a new sequence, then you say yes, and it says, okay, data will be cleared, macro will now run, and boom. It's going to build a new sequence based on the information, again, that was in your sequence data sheet. And it takes about that long, so it's quite remarkable. And the number of products that are in the sheet are the number that you requested. So you may recall I mentioned we had 57. The first row is two, so we now have 57 products that are sequenced. If you wanted to repeat the sequence, you want more than 57, but you want to repeat the same logic, just simply copy these rows uh, and duplicate them, right? And cop copying the, copy them down here, starting with row 59, and that'll give you more demand in your sequence file. Uh, that's something you might want to do so your, your simulator doesn't actually run out of demand. Another feature we've added here and added a button for it is add subs. So when you cha make changes to your product sheet, you may not want to change the sequence, but let's say that you want to add uh, sub-assemblies. You forgot or there was a mistake you made. I can type that. So sub one is also required on say product six. You forgot about that. So if you go back to the sequence, instead of having to find every product six and fill in these blanks, you simply click on add subs and product six will be added automatically. So that's a nice, uh, nice way of populating this because the, the simulator is going to be looking for this information to know which subs to use. So this needs to be complete, but it is duplicating, in a sense, the information that's over here. So this little sequence button just automates the process of keeping those in alignment. Okay. Oh, and uh, by the way, the, uh, the subs are also, you know, generated automatically when you, when, you, when you run the auto sequence. So you don't need to do this twice. It's just in cases where you make changes to the product file and you don't want to change the sequence. Okay, so that's it. So remember this, uh, last point and important point is that the sequence is not terribly useful uh, until you run the simulator. So the idea here is that you would build this file, you'd create a scenario that you want to test, and then you run the simulator to see uh, how, how your throughput is, what utilization and uh, levels of block time, of waiting time, of actual uh, utilization of your resources is with this new sequence. Run a series of experiments. So basically this makes it very easy to experiment with different orders, different, different sequencing strategies so that you can develop your sequencing rules and based on your specific environment, come up with the best plan for sequencing your work. So that's it. Uh, enjoy.